How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Um, cool. First of all, I, I, I have to say, I listened to the, the tune that's up on uh, uh, Apple, Apple Music, uh, To Promise Life. Oh, that's not me. That's a different. That's a different Nate Wood. That's a different Nate Wood. If it's if it's rap, it's not me. No, it's not rap. No, it's with Donnie Tune McCaslin Prom and Ike Strum. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's me. Yeah, sorry, that's me. <laughs> it's okay. I was hoping so because I was gonna say, dude, there's somebody else there out there that plays drums like you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's me. That's right. I I didn't know what that song was called because it was like labeled fifteen eight or something when he sent it to me. So. Oh really? Okay. How yeah. did that? So. I'm assuming that was like a, a Zoom thing. Yeah, I just did it. I did that like two months ago or something <clears throat> during the pandemic. Yeah. yeah so yeah. he just sent me a MIDI demo and I just did a take and sent it to him. And he's like, great. So, it's, yeah. It's it's amazing. Yeah, I, pretty awesome. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's very awesome. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, um, it, it just shows a, a, your, your, your flexibility or all the things that you're into, man. It's like... Um, I, I've done a, I've done a, a lot of things and t taking a look at all your solo work that you have up on Bandcamp, you know, mm -hmm. all the way up to um, the, the the one that you debuted. I think you were covering that album, uh, your your last one, um, mm -hmm. for X mm -hmm. dot it, X it, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You did that at Pasic, right? You. Yeah. Yep. That's right. So mm -hmm. I took a, I, I, I took a look at those and I read some of the, the, the comments that people were making and they were like the best um, the best uh, solo instrumentalist in the, for the 21st century. <laughs> That's really nice. It, it is. Mm -hmm. It is. It is very nice. You know, um, I remember the days when I used to think Todd Rundgren was the best or even when Paul Thanks. McCartney did it. And I think, wow, this is amazing. Did he really play all the drums on that? Did he really do that? Right, right. So yeah, I mean, he, I mean, there's, wasn't there a quote where he was like, "Ringo's a really good drummer, but he's not even the best drummer in the Beatles." Yes, I think he said something like that. So, but Ringo was the best drummer in the Beatles. Come on, let's be honest. But Paul is, Paul's awesome. Paul's my favorite Beatle, um, which is kind of um, controversial because you're supposed to say John, but Paul's my favorite for sure. Um, but yeah, I love Todd Rundgren too, actually. And uh, I think my favorite one-man band is Stevie Wonder, actually, by far. I think he's the best. I think he's my favorite musician of the 20th century because he's the most complete. He can do everything, you know. Like he's the he's a perfect songwriter. He started. He basically invented a genre, and like he's the best singer, and his records are just timeless. Anyway, but thank you for that. In other words, but I like one-man bands. Absolutely. I can tell you that I did not know until I was listening to the Hotter Than July album mm -hmm. this weekend mm -hmm. uh, I, and stream it. And I always I always check out who's who's playing drums mm -hmm. and found out that there's only two tracks on that album that there's a drummer. Other than that, it's all Stevie. Yeah, it's like you can tell it's Stevie because the time is really funny. It's very expressive, but he does things that drummers would never do like when he gets excited and goes to a chorus or whatever, he'll just play stuff that a drummer would never play. And it's so expressive and musical and interesting, you know? Um, I don't know. I learned a lot from his drumming, just things that make a lot of sense to do that you're never taught to do as a drummer. You know, like he does a thing at the beginning of uh, Heaven is 10 zillion light years away, where he like, he's like, it's a halftime thing. And then he just double times it for like a bar, you know, and then drops back down. It's like no drummer ever does that. But, you know, I do that every once in a while. And it's always like, whoa, nobody ever does that. It's like I stole that from Stevie Wonder. But I think I think the, the fun thing about one I'm kind of rambling here. But the, no. the fun thing about one man bands is that you get to hear uh, people playing instruments the way that that people who normally play that instrument don't play that instrument. And that, you know, is kind of more informative than like learning how to play drums from the best drummers or learning how to play, you know, or like the thing that I really don't like, especially is like electric bass players who only learn electric bass solos. Because to me, that's like the most limited vocabulary and history of, of soloistic intent. 
So it's like you have Jocko and Stanley Clark and like a few people and then bass players just learn those. And it's like, no, you should really learn like John Coltrane solos or like Keith Jarrett solos or Herbie Hancock solos. That's what those guys did, you know? Anyway, so I'm saying about just like the learning, learning about your instrument from other instruments' perspectives is, is what I'm getting at. So, anyway. I, saw, I, saw, I saw that today when mm -hmm. I, I saw on the sign outside of the YouTube video, it said mm -hmm. Donnie Klaskin Group and Kneebody, and I mm -hmm. went in and looked at it, and you were playing bass in, guess, his, yep. in, his, ba in his band. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did a lot of uh, a lot of bass playing in his band. Um, a lot of my history, I've said this in other interviews, but um, usually with, with people, I start by playing drums with them, and then eventually they learn I'm a good bass player, and then they hire me for bass, and they like me in that position too, and then I start kind of rotating. And then sometimes if, if it's practical, uh, the same thing happens with guitar. They'll hear me play guitar and be like, oh, actually, I'd like to hire you for guitar for this gig. So I end up kind of playing multiple roles in uh, in most of the projects that I'm in, um, which is cool because I get multiple perspectives, you know, like I get to play, I've gotten to play the drums, uh, I've gotten to play the bass on Donnie's gig with Mark Juliana and Zach Danziger, and so just to get to hear different approaches, you know, it's really cool. So, yeah, it's fun. It is, it, it, it's, it's, when you read the, I think it was National Public Radio that left, that gave a, a you know told about told about one of the videos mm -hmm. and, and, and as in I'm switching to Kneebody, they said that mm -hmm. each each of these individuals have completely different job, things that they do outside of that and they come come together which is kind of mm -hmm. like what you just said yeah 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 we're that that band is really just a like a, a collective of, of you know very diverse um, versatile musicians you know and that was that was what I always loved about that band was it's always been that everybody in that band's always had such diverse um, interest in music that it, it made that that band be able to sound so diverse and wide, you know, musically uh, and unique, I think. But yeah, so here's a, I'm just going to show you just because I, I just moved, but I don't have my um, I don't have my studio set up right now, but I'm doing a, a live from our living rooms thing tomorrow. So this is I'm in the like the t small bedroom of my house right now. Um, and just, I have to do like a little, like a small performance tomorrow, but I can't really play too loud because my neighbors can hear me. So I'm just trying to experiment with ways to, you know, play oh, it's live cool. stream for people without doing my full thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but, um, so you yeah, can't, been... so you can't play now. I can't do full. Yeah. I can't do full volume. I'm just basically like brushes only, you know, like muffling on everything, really thin cymbals. Um, the, the the acoustic tile the I have those. Oh, these things, yeah, yeah. I have like three hundred in my garage. It's like I couldn't fit them all in here. It's soon... well worth the money to treat treat your drum room. It it makes it even more of a difference, I think. For me, when I was working in fully treated spaces practicing drums, I got better faster because I could actually hear what my touch was doing. It's like a bad room will amplify resonances that aren't there. So say you're playing in a room with low ceilings, you'll hit a ride cymbal and you'll be like, ah, that, there's a frequency in there that I don't like, but that's not your touch and that's not the cymbal, it's the room. So it's like, if you're working in an acoustically neutral environment, you actually learn more about your touch, um, I think. So I would recommend putting money into it. Um, so would you, say, know, would you yeah. excuse me, would I, you, I, have, I have a question for you. I've always hated, and that's a strong word, but I've always disliked the sound of my rides forever, ever since I played. And mm -hmm. I think that's why. It once, if it doesn't sound good to you, you I, I can't play. And so exactly. I, I put it away. It has to be what that's, it is. that's a big part of it. I mean, finding stuff that re instruments that resonate with you too makes a big difference. It's like, I've gotten to the point where I can kind of make any cymbal sound passable because I have to play a lot of cymbals on backline gigs. Um, but, you know, when I get to play on my own cymbals, which I chose myself, I just play way better, so. It's a balancing act. It's both things, but um, but yeah, I would say definitely invest in GIK for your your drum room. It'll it just cha it changes the quality of the recording too. It's basically like if you have a good sounding room, you can cr throw up crappy mics and it sounds professional. But if you have amazing mics and you have a crappy room, it's always going to sound like crap. So exactly, I think exactly. I think acoustic. I, yeah, I think acoustic treatment is the 
most important thing about a room. Like the most important thing, like the most important piece of gear that you can have, you know? So anyway. It made, it, it, like I said, it, it made a world of difference um, mm -hmm. as soon as I started playing vinyl because it's the same thing as when I started listening to mono. Mm -hmm. I, listened to, I listened to The Doors' first album in mono mm -hmm. right next to the stereo one and went, there's not even anything. That's when the treatment was up. And I said, there's right. not any, it was one of the, one of the hardest hitting rock albums that I had heard before that. I never thought of it as a rock album per se, uh -huh. you know, it was like, you know, the, the typical thing. So that it brings out nuances like that. And then you can go in to say that, it, you know, if you get real into it, cabling makes a difference, you know, yeah. cartridge makes a difference. Treatment is the number one thing. And I think that's the most overlooked thing in the audio community. It's like people will spend like thousands of dollars on banana cables before they'll like put one piece of sound treatment up, Correct. you know, exactly. And the sound treatment will make all the difference immediately, you know, and cables is still debatable. It's like it makes a difference, but it's a 2% difference as opposed to a 70% difference Correct. with treatment. You know? Correct. So. And you get to a, you, you get to a place where it just becomes, you know, um, look at all the drummers that have, you know, 2000 snares and I only play three, you know, right. I, I play one snare drum, basically. I own like four or five, but I play one. I play one drum. <laughs> I found one I like, and I can kind. Of, I kind of make them all sound the same. So, it's really just about learning your gear, I think. So, do but. you play when you when you play? Like for example, it was um, when was it? It was 2000, 2017 when you were when in uh, Iowa Iowa City with the Donnie McCaffrey group, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I know that all the all the gear, the the main gear came from the the, the local music store. So all the drummers yeah. played the same 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 kit. Yeah, and usually I bring my cymbals on tour with me. But that gig, I think it was A Customs, which you know I'm an Istanbul Agop user. So A Customs are about as different as you can get from what I usually play. Um, but I think. Maybe the airline lost my cymbals. I can't remember why I couldn't bring my cymbals. Or maybe I was coming from a, ba a tour where I was playing bass and I didn't want to bring my cymbals just for one gig. But uh, yeah, it was. I mean, I always play backline, but that gig was. I remember playing those Zildjians, and I was like, it's kind of fun. I I thought they sounded fine. I you know learned how to hit them, and it was fine. They, but that's. I think that's something that I. Um, I think that's something you just get better at doing from doing it over time is learning how to sit down at a at a, a new kit and make it feel like your own and sound like your own instantly you know i think uh drummers who kind of just spend all their time in their own room they don't know how to adapt as fast um but that's one of the things that i've learned how to do just from playing on thousands and thousands of kits throughout my career you know so it's kind of a fun new challenge i mean of course when i get to a gig and they have like the gretsch kit that's to my spec and I get to play my own cymbals, then it's a better gig, you know. But um, it's kind of fun getting to just play new stuff every night. So. When you were at PASIC, I remember I was on the uh, I was on the stage, and you were um, working with multiple people, getting get, getting your set together. Um, mm -hmm. How much how much of that was to your specs? I think that whole kit was exactly to my specs, which is a little bit daunting. That's just like I feel like a little overprivileged when it happens or something. Um, but yeah, I think that was because it was the Gretsch guys were there and the Remo guys were there and they're just like, you want diplomats on the bottom? Like everything was exactly what I wanted, you know? So yeah, that was cool. Yeah. And that, that particular stage was all done by, I believe it was, um, Earthworks. I believe the, uh, the, uh, the microphones were all the same. Oh. Mm -hmm. If I believe, if nice. I, if I remember right, uh -huh. um, I had a, I had very good vantage points from both, both ends. I mean, I was up on stage and then I was right in, right in front. So mm -hmm. I was able to, um, they basically, they, they do a good job. The, the engineers do a, a very, a very good job. So yeah, I, totally. I re really, it was pretty that, that was early on for me. Like this project is still pretty new and that was, you know, only four or five months in to me actually playing live. So it was kind of, it wasn't kinks weren't as quite as worked out, but they were, it was, it was smooth. They were, you know, they're pros.